Hi EX and welcome to the EX podcast episode number 55. This is your host Stefan Vincent. I'm here today with you because we need to shake things up in the world of HR, talent acquisition and company culture in order to create positive employee experiences in our organizations. Your workplace doesn't have to be a dreadful place where employees feel disengaged. This podcast brings a different lens to the HR, employee engagement, and company culture conversation. We approach these topics from a brand and customer experience perspective, rather than a traditional HR perspective. Our guests are thought leaders and disruptors in the EX space in their own way, come to this show to share best practices on the key elements that foster employee engagement and strengthen company culture, and also to spark the conversation on how to create these positive employee experiences. Not every company can do what Airbnb or Google do around their employee experience, and this is what this show is all about, sharing stories of companies of all sizes not only to show that EX doesn't require a large budget or large team, but also that there isn't one recipe. Each company can find its own way through the EX journey. Today's guest is Rex Miller, a five-time Wiley author. Two of his books have won international awards for innovation and excellence. He's also a respected futurist, frequent keynote speaker, and an elite leadership coach. Rex was a guest on this podcast last year, and he's coming coming back with a very interesting and quite thought-provoking book, The Healthy Workplace Nudge. Today with Rex, we will talk about what is a healthy workplace, why and how do we need to rehumanize the workplace, how we can shift the corporate mindsets to make work a place where it feels good to be in versus a dreadful and stressful environment? Who should be responsible for creating a healthy work environment? And what are the key elements for a healthy workplace? And whether the concept of workplace happiness is a utopia or a reality? And finally, Rex will share with us some examples of healthy workplaces. This episode is brought to you by Fusion Alliance. Fusion Alliance delivers holistic solutions fusing together data, digital, and technology to redefine customer experiences and move your ideas to execution. That's why businesses across multiple industries have relied on Fusion's expertise and partnership for over 25 years. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Rex. And because it takes a good amount of time to produce this podcast, please make sure to review the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or YouTube, as it would help promote the content. If you want me to speak at your next event, get some advice on your EX initiatives, or send me feedback, suggestions for future topics or guests, you can reach me at svincent at exsummit.com or on Twitter at ex underscore summit. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the EX podcast. Super excited for today's guest, a returning guest, Rex Miller. Rex is a best-selling author, futurist and keynote speaker and he's coming back with a very interesting and quite thought-provoking book the healthy workplace nudge rex thanks for being uh, with us today stefan you're welcome uh, it's good to be here and uh, it's good to, to get out of the shoot here early in the publication of the book so thank you So for those who may have missed the first episode that we did together last year, could you tell us a bit uh, bit more about who you are, um, what you've done, and then we'll get into the book itself? Sure. Uh, My practice focuses on a couple of key areas, and one of them is to tackle what's called wicked problems. You know, these are complex issues that leaders are commonly frustrated with but don't have easy solutions to. 
I developed a process called MindShift that brings diverse leaders together over a period of about two years. And then we use this very active learning model where we travel to positive outliers uh, to look at what they're doing and get behind the scenes. And then we begin just connecting the dots and telling the story. Uh, so that's been the thought leadership side of the work we do. And then we turn that thought leadership into uh, practice and services. And and, uh, and so that makes up a good a good bit of what I do. The, the book itself is quite, I would say, alarming. At the same time, I would say it sets the vision for something that would be much more optimistic. So why and how did you choose this topic for the book? That's a great question. It really is an offshoot of the previous book when I was on about workplace culture and mm -hmm. how we can use design and the process of understanding how we want to live and work together as a way to enhance and improve culture and engagement. Uh, we told a story in the book about the CBRE headquarters project in L.A., Now, that was really late in the previous book, and when I got there, I was looking at it from primarily from a story of great change leadership. I mean, it, it really hits all the uh, and, uh, and because of that, the company experienced just profound transformation, uh, both in the office and then it began rippling out into the rest of the company. Uh, they also had uh, 14,000 visitors in the first 18 months. I mean, just imagine about 1,000 visitors a month coming to your company. And it's not a big office. You know, it, it's, it's 250 people at the most. Mm. Now, you know they were coming. We've all seen great workplaces. So they weren't coming just to see a cool workplace. Yeah. What they wanted to hear is how did you pull this off? How did you use this as a catalyst to not only – change and shift your culture, but, but really elevate your business model. Uh, Lou Horn, the president of the of Southern California division, kept ordering boxes of change your space, change your culture. And after a while, I called him up and asked, what's going on? I mean, you keep ordering these cases of books. And then he shared a little bit about the story, and I went out and I had to see for myself. So when I went out there, what he told me was the story I missed. Uh, what I missed was the, the health and wellness side of their story. They were the first commercial building that received the well-building standard uh, certification. The first time in history, medical science and building science came together to create a measurably healthy building. Uh, now, I gave maybe a paragraph of focus on that in the previous book, but I totally missed the significance of it. So we convened a group of about 15 leaders in the summer of 2015 to ask, what does this mean? I mean, the interest, what it's done for your business. We also started seeing a lot of wellness presentation showing up in the industry mm -hmm. trade shows. Uh, but what we found is no one really knew what they were talking about. Uh, you know, we're builders and architects and designers. We don't have a medical background or a wellness background, and yet we're out there talking about this trend. So that began the journey for us to, to just get ahead of the, the wagon, so to speak, and find out how do we need to ground ourselves in this conversation and, and be a legitimate source of information and knowledge to our clients. Dr. Roizen from the Cleveland Clinic said in your book, our job is to develop healthy employees who bring energy to work. That's the only way the corporation can survive. So it sounds like a basic concept, but why is it so hard to make it happen? That's a great question. Um, and, and it's true. Very few companies know how to create healthy environments. And, and what we saw is we looked at cultures of health, you know, companies that really focus on health and well-being. But then we looked at healthy cultures. And they're very different. I mean, sometimes they're the same, but they're very different in terms of their focus. Um, when we came out of the meeting at, in Los Angeles, 
to begin the research, the first person I went to talk to was Dr. Roizen. Uh, for the very reason is we didn't know anything about the medical side of the challenge. So we first asked the question, what is the problem wellness is trying to solve? Mm-hmm. And this quote by Dr. Roizen really goes upstream to the real problem. And the real problem is that 50% of our population has some form of chronic disease. And that's driving our health costs. So imagine 50% of the population with the cost rising at somewhere between 5 to 7% a year. Uh, that means within the next 10, 10 years, our health costs will double. That means a company that's spending between the employee and the company an average of about $18,000 per employee, about $12,000 for the company, $6,000 for the employee on health costs, that's going to double in the next 10 years. What does that do to your bottom line? And even more alarming is what it's going to do to our, our national costs. Right now, we're at 18% GDP. Imagine in 10 years, we're at 36% GDP. Right. And Dr. Roizen projected a scary scenario that literally shook me after my meeting at looking at the prospects of this and trying to get into the reason why work has become such a stress-filled, high-pressure, dehumanizing experience in general. And the numbers that we talked about last time that 70% of the workplace is disengaged, they haven't moved at all. It's still the same numbers. So... We have a huge challenge that is not only a financial threat to companies, but as Dr. Roizen said, that's just the tip of the iceberg of the cost. It's the disengagement, the presenteeism, the absenteeism in the workplace. And when companies need to be agile, imagine only being only 30% of your workforce being able and willing to adapt to change easily. Um, and just imagine when you're not at your best and you've got to accommodate big changes or disruptions in life. Um, companies are dying uh, because they're not able to mobilize a workforce who's engaged and looking at the overall health of the company into new you know, business challenges and new opportunities. So it's all connected. And it really begins with, you know, you look at, you need to bring vital vitality to work, and that begins with happiness, which leads to health. So wh- wh- how would you define a healthy workplace? We'll probably go to some examples of companies later in the sure. conversation, but first of all, maybe let's tackle a little bit about the definition of a healthy workplace. A healthy workplace is number one, and, and Google has done a great job in their research on what what is a high-performing team? And they have five criteria. After a couple years of research of over 180 management teams, and and I asked this question to all of my audiences, what do you think is the most important, important criteria for a, a high-performing team? And of course, you get vision or leadership or talent and all that. But they came away with psychological safety. The ability to feel vulnerable mm. And that you're secure in your role, in your place at work. That is the first step. And, and so we looked at research in, uh, in baboons, <laughs> for, which seems to be off topic, but really on topic. Because that same con- those conclusions in the primate culture follow us as primates into the workplace. And we found the difference between pecking order culture and grooming cultures. Uh, And so companies like Google are trying to shift into a more grooming culture. GoDaddy is a good example of a complete turnaround of a hard nose, high, you know, high stress environment into one of the most engaging, great places to work that you, you can imagine. And it all begins there, the tone at the top. You know, we've heard that phrase, tone at the top. That begins, and then you can begin building kind of the the habits and the attitudes, the practice and the ecosystems that you need, the relational ecosystems and the processes that support that number one criteria that I can come to work, bring my whole self to work. I don't have to put a mask on when I get to the front door. 
I can do work that I love doing, you know, that's part of the engagement thing, doing what you naturally do best and enjoy most in a group of people where we're committed to one another and helping one another. That's, that's a big ask to have, but it can be done. We saw it being done. Uh, but most leaders are not connected enough to the front lines and to how work actually gets done to kick in that mirror neuron of em- empathy or care, to give a damn. And so we get that, you know, um, undercover boss syndrome. So let's go a bit deeper into this. You mentioned several times in your book that we need to rehumanize the workplace. What do you mean exactly by this? Well, when when an organization begins to be run strictly towards efficiency, mm-hmm. we take human judgment out of the equation. Uh, one of the one of the areas of research we did it was on work stress. So there's two components, and there's positive stress and negative stress. Mm -hmm. One of those components is uh, cognitive load, how much brain power and demand and judgment does this take? Uh, So that's one continuum, low to high. The other is autonomy or agency, the ability to have discretion in how you get that work done. So you can imagine... For example, a architectural firm, and that principal at an architectural. Firm, sorry, you're hearing my dog in the background, so I don't <laughs> no know if, if I've got four dogs and we usually have UPS showing up, so you may hear that. Uh, so, getting back to the cognitive load, at the high end of of affirming work is someone like. Uh, uh, a senior principal at an architectural firm, high demands, but high discretion on how, creativity. On the bottom side is a call center employee, high demand and stress because you don't know who's going to be on that next call Mm -hmm. and you're scripted, no autonomy. Uh, So we find this area of load a a real, real big issue in work. So one is how do we design the nature of work? And two, how do we resource and facilitate people in the workplace Human connection, uh, being just the simple thing of being able to access the resources you need easily, taking friction out of work, which is part of Dave Radcliffe's um, primary objective at Google. Our job is a as corporate head of facilities and construction. He says our primary job is to take the friction out of work. Uh, so that'll lead into another topic. I, I like the the word friction. Actually, when, when I speak at events, uh, I always said that we need to bring the F word to work, <laughs> which is which is not exactly what you think, but you know it's fun, it's freedom, oh, okay. All it's right. flexibility, it's the yeah. idea of embracing failure and get away from the fear aspect of the workplace, as you said, you know, being monitored, um, having a script when you're call center, not, uh, the lack of flexibility and autonomy. Um, and I think that the thriving companies like GoDaddy, for instance, are yeah. the ones who really bring that F word concept to work. Well, and a good example of a call center that does that is Zappos. You know, if you go yes. up to Zappos, they don't time you. Your job is to make that person's day a great day. And that could be sending them flowers. I mean, they, they give lots of discretion and time to people doing that front end work. So it doesn't have to be a grind. But because a lot of our, our when we get into upper levels, we, we kind of uh, fragment looking at the work as a whole and we look at it at spreadsheets. And so then our decisions get driven by spreadsheet decisions as opposed to human decisions. Yeah, and I'll do a little self-promotion here, but you mentioned Zappos and GoDaddy, and actually I did speak to uh, Jamie Norton a few months ago. She's the chief chief of staff at Zappos on the culture, and also did an episode with uh, Katie Van Horn. She was the VP of talent acquisition at GoDaddy at some points as well. So for those listening to the show um, right now, just uh, look at iTunes or the website and uh, look for those episodes. Um, I love this part in the book when, when you say the person you report to at work is more responsible to your health than your doctor. And it's, it's, it's very true, I would say, 
But how can we shift the corporate mindsets to make work a place where it feels good to be versus a dreadful and stressful environment? Yeah, it's a great question. For just a couple factoids, heart attacks go up 20% on Mondays. Um, and work is now considered to be the fifth leading cause of death. Uh, Japan actually has a word for it called kuroshi, death by work. So, and stress, uh, 78% of employees list workplace as the number one cause of stress, and and it's either high or very high. So 78% say work is either high or very high stress. And how do we do that? First, we, we, we really under, under prepare, under resource managers. A lot of time, mm-hmm. and I was just with a company, a large medical device company yesterday. And uh, a lot of these managers were great tech, technicians, right. know, great engineers. Uh, and we've got a great quote in the book from Josh Glenn saying a lot of the load and responsibility goes to those mid managers, but we don't train them how to be managers and we don't give them the time to be managers. And then they, the managers have this challenge of the 70% disengagement. So they have to babysit 50% and then they have to put out fires for 20%. So they have no time to do developmental work, to do coaching, Mm -hmm. to be strategic. So that is a great miss, I think, in corporate America in general. Uh, and anybody who's been in a large corporation knows what mid-management is like. You get promoted because you're a good salesperson or a good technician, and it's the training is the, a pat on the back and good luck. Right. Uh, and so I think that's the first line of defense. Uh, the same thing. The same thing applies in teaching too. You know, the the key to to companies is winning the hearts and minds of the people who work there, and yet we're sending in unprepared and wounded warriors to do that. And those are your managers. They're not prepared and they're they're hurting themselves. They're under stress themselves. So I think that's the first place to start. And I would say that oftentimes the role of a manager is highly administrative as well. As well. You need to... Um, you need to look at, you know, uh, hours. You need to look at... Um, yeah, you know, me- metrics and how your team is performing. You have you have a lot of things that you need to monitor, and many of those things could somehow be automated actually by uh, technology, so that would allow people and managers to really focus more on, as you said, the coaching and uh, team development aspect of their job. Correct. Yep, I agree totally. So, any type of programs implemented in organizations. Again, it's a quote from the book, strip away the experience and are too often delivered as a one-size-fits-all approach. And that's always been my, my take since I started the uh, podcast and the EX Summit. It is, you know, I try to bring that uh, brand and customer experience perspective and companies do this very well on, on the customer side. They are able to really understand what their different customer segments needs and wants, and they're able to customize the experience to those different segments. Why is it so hard to do this on the employee side? Because we don't look at them as customers. Um, we don't look at them through the, the work experience. Now, there are several companies who do. You know, Google does. GoDaddy, GoDaddy gives their um, provides hospitality training to their uh, their frontline support services, their janitorial food services people, because they want their people to give the kind of experience to the employees that GoDaddy gives to their customers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're starting to see more hospitality thinking coming into the workplace. Um, it, it's really at an early phase. But we, we don't consider, and I think it starts somehow in the way we craft human resource departments. Uh, Steve Carter in our group asked the question, do we look at them as human resources or, or human resources? You know, where's the emphasis, on the human side or the resource side? And for most companies, we see employees as replaceable components that, that you know, the resources. Uh, and you can tell that by the way they even approach their strategy towards wellness. 
you can see the, the different levels of how they perceive their employees by the way they approach the whole question of health and well-being in the workplace. So who should be responsible for a healthy workplace? I would assume that it's not just the company itself, right? It's all the different layers within the organization, but also the employees themselves, right? I mean, it's really hard to separate our personal lives to our professional lives, and whatever happens on the personal side is brought to work, and vice versa. What happens at work is brought yeah. back to your home uh, at the end of the day. So who, in, in your mind, in your opinion, who would, should, you, should own the, uh, the healthy workplace? It's a great question. So health is a social experience. Uh, you can experience health outside of the relationships you're with. Uh, Dr. Nicholas Christakis's work showed that people who tend to be obese have networks of people who value food and family and fellowship. And, and so the social network is important, but it really begins with the leadership, uh, talking the talk, being persistent, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, walking the talk, being persistent, being engaged and seeing this, you know, like like the CEO at Johnson & Johnson or Toby Cosgrove at Cleveland Clinic. It begins there, and it begins by understanding the challenge people go through with these, that, that it's not just a personal – I mean, anybody who's tried to lose weight or quit smoking or do any of that knows how tough it is without a social network of support. Uh, so creating that environment that embraces that, uh, looking at – the company through not only culture, but its environment. I mean, the environment has a huge impact. You show up for a, a meeting in the morning and you see scones and muffins and coffee and sugar. And, and, and so all the cues that we create in the environment are really important as well. So there, there is kind of this domino effect of things we can do, uh, even creating a healthy building. I mean, the lighting that you and I are, are, are taking in right now is going to affect our sleep tonight. Mm -hmm. Our circadian optic nerve is going to be effective. So unless we begin thinking about the challenge of we, we spend, you know, 60% of our, our, our life, our, our wake, waking life in, in an office at work, we spend 90% of our time in buildings and we have leadership that somehow is not connected with the challenges and the struggles that we have. So there's a long way to go. It's not, it starts with leadership, but it's all around us and it, and it trickles into our families as well. Uh, that's why we like what Barry Waymiller does and Bob Chapman. Uh, he, he knows that the experience an employee has, positive or negative, they're going to take that positive energy or negative energy back home and affect three to five other people and those people are going to affect others. So we have a tremendous opportunity to have people go home feeling better about themselves and, and actually healthier coming to work than when, when they arrived in the morning. So what would be the, the main, let's say, three, four, five key elements of a healthy workplace? So we, we talked about you know, the fear or the freedom however we want to spin it. You know, like we should get rid of the notion of fear in the workplace and embrace more the notion of freedom. There's the um, you know, healthy foods, uh, not to you know, get too, much, uh, too, too many sweets and uh, like junk food in the workplace, basically. There's the notion of physical exercise as well. There's probably the notion of mental and psychological exercise as well. So uh, if, we, if you were to, to frame or to define maybe three, four, five key elements for a healthy workplace, what would they be? Yeah, so we have, uh, we have an image of dominoes in the book. And the reason, and interesting, we put leadership and culture at the very last side of it. And that's counterintuitive. You know, most of us start with that. But when we did our research, we found that was the hardest thing for companies to do. And what we found were what we call sandcastles. You have one good leader in and then they go and then it all gets washed away from the next. Yeah. So we looked at, so what can we do to kind of build momentum that would shift culture and engage leadership? So the very easiest thing to do are nudges. That's the behavioral economic side of 
little subtle design nudges within the building that make it more enticing to take the stairs or the healthier choices are are more acceptable. That's low cost, easy to do. It takes some thinking and some real strategic thinking and workplace design to do that. And then the next thing, the next no-brainer cost is a healthy building. It costs less to to upgrade a building to either uh, the well building standard or fit well uh, than it does to provide a wellness program. And it's only a one-time cost. So it costs less uh, to to upgrade a building than it does to provide one year of wellness program for your employees. Uh, and, and so that's number two. The third one is beginning to take the friction out of work. So a lot of that's design, not, not just environmental design, but work design. That's that cognitive load agency thing. That's that our people, you know, we use the Gallup Strength Finder because we find it's a great way to help align work to, to the way people naturally do best. Uh, but creating human connection, creating recovery zones, uh, getting really good acoustics because focus work is one of the best ways to to feel good at the end of the day of having really done quality work and the opposite that creates high stress is is fragmentation and distraction so those are the three easy things and then we get into a leadership of care you know caring leadership and then a culture of health and then a healthy culture so we kind of go up this ladder and start with the easy things first so when you when companies implement uh, wellness programs, how do you get employees engaged in the long time? So obviously there's uh, there's a notion of disengagement at work from the work itself and the interest in the the tasks and the job that employees are doing. Uh, but we saw this all the time as well. You know, if you go to a gym in January, February, you will have a lot of people, and then suddenly March comes, right. and no one is uh, no longer in the gym because people just stop exercising. So, how do you keep employees engaged into wellness programs over a long period of time? <laughs> so. My conclusion out of this is wellness programs are ineffective and are and do not even have the ability to be effective. I mean, wellness programs, number one, less than 15% of employees engage in wellness programs. Mm -hmm. The latest National Institute of Health Building Science report out of the state of Illinois showed that you're only affecting about 4.5% of your work population with wellness programs, yet you have to spend it over 100% of employees. And of 15% that participate, what they said were 10% of them are inframarginal. Now, I had to look up the word inframarginal, but inframarginal means that those 10% would do it anyway whether you had a program or not. So if you look at the fundamentals, and this is why it was really important for us to look at the fundamentals of the problem, Uh, 80% of your company's health costs come from 5% of your population. And those are either lifetime or lifestyle chronic issues that didn't happen overnight. And the nature of a wellness program to take a few more steps and to eat healthy is not going to change their habits or diet. or, And it's not going to reverse 20 or 30 years of practice. They need some very strong intervention in order to shift that. So fundamentally, you look at the whole wellness problem challenge, and it's built on uh, wrong assumptions, faulty data, and myth. I mean, the the big myth out there is $1 of investing in wellness program create $3 in return. Uh, Show me where that data and research happened. I spent eight months trying to search it down, and there's no original study Harvard study is the closest thing, and they had to retract that study. Uh, but when you look on, at it, just intuitively, if $1 created $3 in return, every company would be doubling down in wellness efforts. Right. And they're not. They're looking at how to, how to reduce cost. So fundamentally, wellness programs don't work. So I don't encourage investing in wellness programs. So we started this discussion today about the uh, 
staggering increase in healthcare of uh, healthcare costs. All right. So whatever efforts one company is going to make is not going to change how much they're going to pay an insurance premium. Right. So how how do you manage or how do you manage the balance between all the efforts that some companies may be willing to take and to make in building a healthy workplace and no matter what they're going to have to still probably pay the same insurance premium um, like everybody else well that's not necessarily true because in two different companies most large companies are self and to uh, affect that cost. Cleveland Clinic has a new program now that uh, that they've uh, launched in Ohio. That if you follow their program, uh, and and they're an outcomes based program, so they're not a participation based program. So they look at five key metrics uh, for health, and if you're achieving those, then your premiums can come down. Uh, Cleveland Clinic has flattened and begun to reverse the cost curve internally. So I think we're going to find that, uh, first of all, it's it's getting the cart before the horse. Uh, controlling costs is not the motivation to have healthy and happy employees. That's the least of your overall cost. Uh, and so companies that get that, like GoDaddy and Barry Waymiller and NextJump and Google, are freed up people be which leads to healthiness. And over time, it'll affect the cost curve because um, the costs affect all of us. So we talked a little bit about workplace happiness. Is it a, is it a utopia or is it real? Can we really make a, a workplace a place of happiness for the employees? Well, so work is work, <laughs> and uh, and we have a quote from Mike Royko, uh, uh, a famous uh, uh, editorialist in Chicago, that you know they don't call you don't do it for free. You they pay you to do work, but at the same time, there are places where people love coming in. Uh, people love to do good work. There's something life-affirming and soul-satisfying when you can do good work and solve good problems or create great services with people that uh, make a difference. So the, the, the intrinsic attributes of what make you happy, making a difference, using your talents, vital relationships and connection, positive environments, uh, accomplishments, those are all the intrinsic uh, qualities of happiness. That's Dr. Seligman's work and his acronym PERMA. So all of those can be part of a workplace. And, and we've all experienced that. So there's no reason why we can't build and even use that as design criteria for the workplace um, as well. So yes, we've seen companies where people love going to work there, feel that they're making a difference in the world and to their clients, uh, providing for their families, having security, respected, all of those things, but that is not the common experience. And we know in the, in the data and, and the engagement surveys that that's not common. Uh, our goal is to, to make this a more accessible message to leaders, take a lot of wonky data and hard statistics and turn it into something that leaders get it in a, in a gut level and that motivate them to see that, yeah, they can make a difference too. And yes, their company would be better, uh, but it's going to take the leaders to shift their mindsets as well. So could you share some examples of healthy workplaces that you studied for this book um, and what they do or what they've done? So you mentioned a, a bit earlier GoDaddy, for instance, right? And they, obviously, it's a well-established company, a large company, and they were able to make a, um, a huge shift in the way they approach not only the culture, but also the way they interact with their employees. Yes. So uh, about six years ago, they brought in a new CEO and they began to shift the culture. And it really began with 
a building uh, which is now their global tech center, the planning for this building. And the original design was kind of the rudimentary, you know, tech, uh, tech cave type of thing, very Spartan. And, uh, and so the CEO and, and, uh, um, and, and the real estate people at uh, GoDaddy took a very different approach. So it was first built into the environment, um, and they took things, you know, they had a little lounge, just a couple examples. They had a lounge or an area to, with uh, foosball and table tennis and things like that, but it used to be in the back. So the message was that you're sneaking away and it was taboo, nobody used it. Well, so they used behavioral economics nudges and they brought it out in the central area and made it a central feature. Uh, the food is great. And, and they have an island of very healthy food and they have a chef there. Their relationship with ISS um, and uh, it has built this experience manager role where the whole support service is there to make the life and the day of the employees better. Uh, CBRE, in one of their new facilities, created this concierge service that's called the second shift, uh, recognizing that people work hard, but they take a second job when they go home of having to get dinner and take care of chores and all of that. Well, a lot of that is taken off their back through this concierge service that you can call and have groceries pre-purchased for you, ready to go, uh, a meal ready for you. Um, I mean, all of these kinds of services, human touch services are being brought in uh, that make the environment a happier and healthier place to work in. We, we had a summit there and... Uh, there was a GoDaddy employee on, on that person's day off that came in and photobombed us. You know, we were taking a group picture of having done the summit and sat in, his name's Tommy, and said, Tommy, what are you doing here? You know, this is your day off. Um, and he was a tech guy. He said, man, wouldn't you want to be here? Uh, you know, this is just a great place to hang out. My, my friends are here. So that that can be done, and it and it really is not a cost. It it really is a positive investment in your people and your environment and your culture, but it takes a certain kind of thinking and a certain risk taking. Both GoDaddy and Cleveland Clinic got lots of pushback on the financial side doing this at first, um, but they were able to stand in there till the the proof started coming in that yes, this is making a positive difference. There's a notion of macro and micro economics, right? So whatever company, one company is going to do, um, they will still have to deal with uh, the the macro economics of, uh, you know, healthcare costs and uh, employee engagement or disengagements, uh, the notion of employees... You know, leaving the company most of the time after maybe one, two, or three years, so it's no longer a long-term relationship between an employee and an employer. How do you see the next maybe 10, 15 years in terms of employee-employer relationship and the notion of um, health? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so... Um, I think we're going to start seeing a real divide. Uh, we're going to see companies take what you might call a race to the bottom, where low cost is the driver, and it's you know it's modern day sweatshops type of thing. And we already see companies that do that, large high scale companies that that are being driven by uh, quarterly returns and competition, and it's cutthroat. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. And then you see the other side of the equation, companies like Next Jump in New York, where if you make, it's lifetime employment there. Um, and their philosophy is that we're, this is family. And if, you know, if you're going through tough times, you wouldn't cut a member of your family off the payroll. Um, you know, you, you can't come to dinner anymore, son, type of thing. But what they do is they, they provide extensive training to to continue to 
upskill and and grow these people so that they are they are more valuable. So value, you know, we're in we're in a world and economy where your value is not what you produce, but how you grow and learn. And um, companies that get that are putting in their own universities. Barry Waymiller has a university because they saw that we have to upskill people. Johnson and Johnson is taking all the management through their um, high performance institute down in Orlando because they saw the results of clients going through that. They said, we want this value for us. Uh, Cummins is putting in training on basic life skills, gratitude, forgiveness, when to go to bed at night, because we can no longer assume that the, that the youth coming into the workplace have the life skills that were just basic for us in an earlier era. You know, we're finding that this new generation is coming in very social, socially and emotionally fragile. Uh, so getting back to uh, companies being their own universities, their own learning environments, um, and that's a whole other topic about the, the crop coming out of college and into the workplace and the lack of preparation they have to survive in a world that requires continuous learning, resiliency, adaptation, all of that. Um, so yeah, companies are going to have to take their destiny in their own hands. And the best way to ensure yourself is to create a very resilient, adaptable workforce. In the 1940s and 50s, you know, there was a say that um, the companies would take care of their employees, right? Pension plans and long-term career path are these sort of like sort of lifelong employments or at least you know job security to some degree now it's, it's listening to it sounds like you know companies are trying to invest more into uh, those same not, not the same but the uh, similar type of things but with a different uh, d with a twist it's not so much commoditized uh, services or benefits in terms of again pension plans or I mean healthcare obviously is right. important because right. it's expensive but it's more inspirational m a bit more spiritual well that's, a, that's so when we looked at it we found that companies fell into three b buckets or a ladder of how they look at their employees and then how they look at health and well-being so at the very bottom you have this what you might call a a tactical approach where health costs, where it's a risk and a cost to contain. And, uh, and so that's the majority. Let, let's say it's about 80% of companies are in that very tactical vendor. You know, you bring a wellness vendor in and it's a la carte and it's managed. Then you've got companies that see wellness as a strategic opportunity to attract and retain. So they take more of a, you know, wellness is more of a perk. And it's more strategic, and you see it's more custom and design. So you see the companies like the Googles and the GoDaddies see this as a, as a great enhancement. And, and that, that's maybe 15% of companies out there that take that approach. But then there's a small percentage, like the Barry Waymillers and the Patagonias and the REIs of the world, that see this as, a, as part of just being, it's, a, it's the right thing to do. It's a value. It's how you treat people. And, and our mission is to help people be their best and to grow into their best self. Um, so you've still got that, that division. I don't know, you know, the big opportunity is to help that bottom rung move up into that, seeing it as a way to improve bottom line as opposed to just mitigate risk. And now we're getting close to the end of this conversation today. But uh, before we conclude, let me ask you some fun questions, uh, first of all, uh, so that our audience gets to know a bit more who uh, Rex Miller is on a more intimate level, maybe. Uh, if you were to invite someone famous or a historical figure to dinner, who would you pick? Well, there, there would probably be two. One, some people might know Marshall McLuhan, who was kind of the prophet of the new era of communication, broadcast communication. But the other is Jacques Ellul. And Jacques Ellul was a French social uh, theorist and lawyer and uh, theologian. Um, 
and uh, he was the first in the 40s to project this this age of the machine, the dehumanizing effect of technology, and what he called la technique. So he he saw what was going on, you know, almost a hundred years ago, and and wrote about it. So those would be the two. I assume that when you were uh, growing up as a kid, you probably didn't see yourself writing books. Uh, what was your dream job at that at that time? Well, in first grade, it was an astronaut until I found out I got motion sick. <laughs> and then it was a veterinarian through Boy Scouts until I sat through an autopsy of a dead dog and had to leave three mm. or four times because I was going to vomit. Um, and uh, and so, you know, my, my dream job may have been playing tennis. You know, I, I, I did play a lot of tennis and it was, I'm certified as a pro, but never got into the pro circuit. So that could have been a dream job for me. And you did coach uh, a few tennis pros, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, I did. Several years uh -huh. back. Yeah. So you travel obviously a lot uh, to promote your book and you speak at a lot of events. Among all the cities that you've been to, what is your favorite one? Oh my gosh. Well, Chicago, I love going to because I grew up there and the food is great and I know it well. I know it like the back of my hand so I can go to all the off the main path mm -hmm. places. Uh, but uh, I was just up uh, in Seattle at Salish Lodge, which is an hour outside of Seattle. Gorgeous place. Um, so those, those would be two spots that I, I, would, I would enjoy going to over and over again. So we talked about food in Chicago. What is your favorite food? Well, uh, it's off the off the diet menu for me, but Gino's uh, pizza and uh, yeah. uh, Chicago oven grinders, which is a pizza pot pie, uh, and then Gold Coast hot dogs, um, uh, publicans. Uh, I love going to as well. So um, those are some of my favorites. Not super oh, healthy Gibson. though. No, but Gibson <laughs> steak, you know. Gibson's is a good place to go, and you can get a good cut of steak there. All right. Uh, if you were the last man on earth, what would you do? The last man on earth, what would I do? Uh, that's a great question. I'd probably take notes and write a book. <laughs> that no one would read, right? That no one would read, yeah. <laughs> that's the life of an author sometimes. <laughs> All right. What is the way for our listeners to follow you and uh, go MindShift on social media? Yeah, great. So uh, Rex at, well, it's RexMiller.com is the website. And uh, we've got a great promotion for the book right now on the website. So you can get two copies of the book plus two comic books uh, for the price of one book. Mm -hmm. And so that'll be limited through June. And that's the best place to get a hold of me. I'm on LinkedIn, so feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, and, and then I actually do respond to emails, so I, I do answer people. All right, and I'll share, I'll share those on the, on the podcast notes as well. Uh, any last word of wisdom or advice? Well, uh, there's a huge challenge ahead of us uh, nationally. Um, happiness, uh, one of the conclusions was happiness needs to come before health. And we see a nation in pain, um, and it's playing out in some of the most tragic ways. Uh, companies employ 160 million people. Uh, that's half the population. And each of those people go home and affect two or three more. Uh, the workplace I see as, as the best leverage point to try to shift the culture and the current climate that we have. And, uh, and it starts by letting people do good work. Yes, and I, I agree with you because, you know, as you outlined in the books uh, many times, um, you know, the lack of health in uh, individuals and companies is mostly due to chronic diseases created or caused by an unhealthy workplace, right? It's the stress. It is the lack of um, appreciation. It's the you know, not being challenged and uh, challenged intellectually. It's the lack of exercise. And all of this can be addressed um, and can be... Um, 
can be done well in, inside the workplace. Absolutely. Right. I mean, we spend so much time there. Um, it's, it's the first place to go. And I would say the second would be our schools. So if we could just get the workplace and schools, we could change the country. I believe we can change the country. And that's part of our goal and objective is to tell a story that gets people motivated that we can make a difference. Well, thank you so much as a reminder. Um, it was Rex Miller, the author of The Healthy Workplace Nudge uh, at Wiley. And you can find the book on, on his website, rexmiller.com. I'll share this information on the, on, on the podcast notes as well. Uh, thank you so much, Rex, for being with us today. Stefan, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to the EX Podcast. If you want to learn more, visit our website at expodcast.com. If you want to find out more about our next conferences, go to exsummit.com. Finally, you can also find my manifesto on business to employee or B2E branding at b2ebranding.co. See you next week.